Hey, welcome to Accidental Gods, to the podcast where we believe that another world is still possible and that together we can make it happen. I'm Manda Scott and I spent the first series of this podcast laying out the basic toolkit that we think is essential to making conscious evolution a possibility, which is the premise behind the whole Accidental Gods project. This podcast, the website, and the membership program that lies behind it. Since then, we've been digging deep into the extraordinary, lively, inspiring intersection where art meets activism, politics meets philosophy, and science meets spirituality, from which we can craft a vision of a future that is generative for all of us, for the human and the more than human worlds. My guest this week is Mike Raven. Mike is co-founder of a company called AQAI, a company committed to increasing adaptability in people, in businesses, in the teams and entire companies, and in the end, in the whole of our society. Because, as he says in the podcast, there is a tsunami of change coming, and we can't keep going backwards, doing what we've always done, over and over again, isn't working. So we need to find the skills within ourselves to adapt. We need to find our places of discomfort from which true imagination arises. And Mike is someone who walks his talk. He's a trained naturopath. He's travelled widely and met a real variety of people who've given him the depth and adaptability that he then brings to his company. He has worked for some of the biggest companies in the world, but in the end he comes from a place of deep connection to the web of life, to the more than human world, and to the spirit of who we could be. As always with these podcasts, I hit the record button early on, really so we can test the sound levels, and as a way of testing that, I asked Mike about a book that was on the table behind him. His recording space is one of the most beautifully curated I have ever seen. And the book looked really interesting. It was called The Squiggly Career by Helen Tupper and Sarah Ellis. I will put a link in the show notes. So I asked about that. And as is so often the case, his reply was so coherent, so grounded, so thoughtful, and so part of what I wanted to talk about that we took that as our beginning. So the start is a little bit ragged, but it's definitely worth it. And with that in mind, people of the podcast, please welcome Mike Raven of AQAI. Tell me a bit more about Tours of Duty. I just want to check the sound file. Yeah, so this idea that, I guess it's a military analogy, but I don't like that analogy, but a tour of duty being, could be, you know, who knows, a couple of weeks, could be a couple of months, could be a couple of years. And as long as that tour, that, you know, that section of your career um, and your life um, links to a, you know, a duty that's, that's inherently linked to your heart, you know, to your heart space and to um, your why, your kind of icky guy mm. of, of, of why you're here and what you can do for the world and for, for other people. You know, we don't have to stick to this linear path that we've been told of a certain type of education, you know, the step ladder of, of um, jobs and um, the time spent somewhere equals progression. You know, so this this was um, quite some time ago that Reid Hoffman, you know, the, the founder of LinkedIn, was really talking about this, something like 2006, 2008, and I think this year has really sparked that um, opportunity for people with coronavirus. There's now an opportunity to think, well, what is my duty? What is my higher purpose? And what tools might that involve? What little pockets of, of time and um, application contribute towards those different tours of duty? And some of that can be spontaneous. Some of it might be serendipitous. Uh, some of it might be completely intentionally planned. But 
this book that we just spoke about, The Squiggly Career, I think um, perhaps describes it in a in a more fun, dancey sort of way, that it's a squiggly career of, rather than this tour of duty. Come on, we're all soldiers, soldiers of purpose. You know? which, which has a very, that sort of, okay, now I'm just going to have to yomp proper hill again, feeling to it, whereas squiggly career feels more creative and bouncy and, and fun and engaging your joy child and... And yeah, doing things because we enjoy doing them, not because it's our duty. Exactly what it should be. Exactly. Yeah. So so we have started the podcast. This is great. Welcome, Mike Raven, belatedly. I will do an intro later. It'll be fine. Um, because that is exactly why I wanted to talk to you now. Accidental Gods, we've spent a lot of time exploring neurophysiology and economics and spirituality and all of the some of, many of, the ways that we can begin to curate our own lives. And the area that we have never explored on this podcast is the area of business. And it wasn't until I really started listening to AQAI, your podcast with Ross, which is definitely one that people should be listening to, that I began to think about it. I think I work from home. I was a vet, then I'm a novelist. I've never been part of a business in that way. Even when I was a vet, it was at the vet school. It was not a business. Mm. Never made any money. So, and this is, business is the area, it seems to me, economics is defined by the ways that we create value. And the ways we create value is business. And it seems to me that you and AQAI are surfing the cutting edge of what business is these days. Alrighty, so let's take a step back and find out how Mike Raven got to be one of the co-founders of AQ AI. So let's have a have a quick dance through the wonder of your life. Well, I was very lucky, I believe, as a child to spend my time growing up in Dartmoor, down in Devon. My so I found yeah. it's beautiful. Just beautiful and finding comfort in nature amongst trees grasslands woodlands but at the same time I saw a deconstruction in front of me of the family unit in certainly in latter childhood years and at 14 I decided that as soon as I was allowed to I would go as far away as possible and I think it's worth saying that you grew up in Totnes as you told me that once before you and a friend made this pact together that you were going to get away. And I thought, oh my God, what hellhole did you grow up in? And it was Totnes, which is, which is, but isn't that interesting? It was the place you grew up in, so you had to get away from it. Yeah, I think it could have been anywhere. It's, yeah, yeah it's a really interesting point, but it, I don't think it was about the, the surroundings and nature. It was about the um, society that was forming, perhaps. And, you know, I, I'm a non-conformist at heart uh, and at soul, and so the idea of following a particular path felt really uneasy. So it took me to Australia at 18 um, with some traveling and life lessons. Um, I also remember, for example, being told that I couldn't study both drama and music at the same time. I had to choose. And I thought that was bizarre, just another reason to to get away. And actually, when I came back from Australia, I was I had some choices around study and I'd quickly shifted from the idea of studying business and sociology to studying theatre and media and economics. So I think economics and business are very different things and maybe we'll go into that a little bit later. So I did follow the herd to university though and I fell out of love with, with that quite quite quickly actually and that institution so I guess my early career was focused on the the psychology of marketing um, which is very much and has been since the 60s an idea of giving people what they think they want yes or even generating or generating generating the desire before you even give it to them absolutely absolutely and this fake idea of of freedom and what that means Mm. and actually it's just it's just all distraction. And looking back, it was important for me to experience that. You know, I worked with big, big companies like Microsoft and Cisco and LG and 
these monoliths and understood that their goal was to sell more stuff that isn't required to more and more people. So I left that sort of when I turned 30 to about a decade ago and um, went on a real journey of discovery, which took me all around the world. You know, I, it only took me maybe 30 minutes to make this decision. And it was my first journey into the spirit realm, really. And it happened out of the blue in a horrible travel lodge hotel whilst doing some work and lying there on the bed. And yeah, that's that's perhaps another story, but the the colours and the journey. No, well, I the think you should tell us. Okay. Well, that would be well, really the, the, the colours and the journey and the feeling that was reverberating around um, my body and it just really felt profound and something that I had to explore. And I knew I, there was no way to explore that in my current life as it was set up. Had you explored anything of this nature before? In your Absolutely travels? not. Yeah, it was, it was really strange. Wow. Okay. And I, you know, I went into my, um, my business or, you know, to my boss, as we call them the next morning and said, I'm leaving. And, and it, I, I then met, you know, on my travels, um, a shaman in Honduras who um, spends a month fasting in the jungle, which was just um, mind blowing for me. I met a, a naturopath in Costa Rica who actually, who actually offered me a volcanic retreat to say this can this is yours if you want to run it. What is a volcanic retreat? Well, it's just a retreat at the base of a volcano. Okay, but he offered it you not as an experience, but as a as a thing to run. Yes. Wow. And it, this was all quite a lot for me to take in this short space of time. I ended up in in Vietnam, and there was a Vietnamese, wonderful Vietnamese lady who was a medicine woman working with plants. All of this was just created such a shift in me, and. Um, I wanted to return to England. I, I saw it as, as home still. And I set about becoming a naturopath. So how do I train to become a naturopath? So I did that. It took me took me about a year and a half. Um, I also needed to fund my life in in some way, shape or form. And I decided that it was about the, the, the people and specifically the person that I spend my working time with whilst I was training and doing other things. So I was very lucky to meet somebody who I saw as and has been a, a mentor, but also an equal and a really good friend, Ross, who's my co-founder at, at AQAI. And I just wanted to be able to support my own health and well-being transformation. So well-being really showed up as something deeply important to me in, in my heart space and um, I wanted to be able to help others, even if it was just one person that I that I loved or had never met. And I think as soon as you start to go on the journey of understanding epigenetics, you suddenly realise you don't need any pharmaceutical drugs whatsoever to either prevent disease or just to heal yourself. Hang on a minute. So tell us a little bit about that. Can we take a sidestep into epigenetics? Just give us the the elevator speech, if you like. Absolutely. Well, we're all, you know, at a molecular level. You know, we're all molecules, and we're, um, you know, they're they're spaced out. They're not joined together. You know, there's electricity running running through us that um, connects all of that, and the things that we're doing with a lot of our lives that are actually being promoted through the way that perhaps society. Um, organizational institutions and business promote and market things to us, just promote the disconnection of those fibers. Amanda, you talk about what fires together, wires together, you know, in both the hmm. um, the physical and sort of metaphysical sense, um, as well as the spiritual sense. Right. Yeah. And that's really what epigenetics is. And yes. if you're not you're not giving the body and the mind the ability to fire together, then you would have lost already, you know, before you've even started. Yeah. So really that's my um, sense of it, that if you um, can understand even at a base level epigenetics, which should be taught 
in our education system. Um, and there's countless other things that should should be taught in that system that aren't mm. and a lot that are taught that absolutely should not be. So we have another podcast one day on the nature of education. Absolutely. Let's do that. So I think it was a it was a discovery journey and uh, that's what life is, but finding teachers and mentors, really discovering the power of books um, at this time. Mm. I read a book called Conversations with God, which had a quite a profound oh, impact yes. on me and all of this took me towards as well the global goals the um, sustainable development goals from the UN which started to connect the dots for me of um, business economics and what the planet needs it was hey there's a to-do list yeah. and who knows about this to-do list and what are we doing about it okay and you'd met Ross were you working with Ross at this point or for Ross? Yeah, or? certainly working working with Ross and um it was it was his company that um we started building up together to discover the opportunity to work inside the UN system and these sustainable development goals. Wow. So can you tell us a little bit about what the sustainable development goals are for people who are not familiar with the concept? Sure. So um, it started with the millennial development goals, actually, back in year 2000. And all of the UN states, so a lot of countries coming together to agree these, which really were the profound challenges that our planet faced. And um, there was a blueprint and a plan to address those. And there was some progress and it was important to have you know that collective agreement but they didn't work you know they they weren't solved um otherwise we wouldn't be facing the challenges we're facing today um they evolved into the sustainable development goals so they launched in 2015 at Schumacher there were a lot of people who were very anti the SDGs saying sustainable and development are not compatible words um but you obviously thought that they were worthwhile and and attainable. I wasn't sure they were attainable, but I thought at the very least it was a a blueprint and a signpost for some of the larger organisations that I knew of and had relationships with to say to be able to have the confidence to go to them and say, "Have you seen these? What do you think? And what are you doing?" Mm. Some of them were saying, "Right, we've seen them." we don't believe they're fit for purpose and we're doing something else. Others were saying, yes, we are, and we're deeply involved and, and we've signed up. But whether that's signing up versus actively taking part uh, is are two very different things. Yeah, And it, it helped us focus our own um, mindsets inside the organisation that we were focused on and running to look at how are these resources that these companies have being uh, directed in the right areas for the planet. Because if they're going to truly be for the planet and for society, which is what I inherently believe businesses are for, then Hmm. they needed some help. And until the chief sustainability officers become a core part of the C-suite, and until chief inspiration officers and perhaps this idea of a chief future officer become really important part of the C-suite of um, having the ear of the CEO, then I think we're going to stay in trouble from a business perspective. Mm. Yes. I think Rob Hopkins has the idea of a chief imagination officer. Wonderful. That, yeah. that there should be these. And yet, I have met people who were the sustainability officers for quite big companies, often met them at Schumacher, and their despair always was that basically they were there and they could have spent their entire office week counting the paper clips and nobody would have cared or noticed because they were Absolutely. window dressing. It was a box ticking exercise. Yeah, we have one of these, therefore we're good people. So... We're leaping ahead a bit, but let's follow this thread because you said that you believed that business was for society and for the planet, and yet clearly there are businesses that are wholly destructive. You know, I look at fracking and perhaps I'm being judgmental, but I find it quite hard to know, to see, or the tar sands in Athabasca or 
any of the fossil fuel industries. There are there are businesses which are neither for society nor the planet, but are wholly for the enrichment of those who run them. How, in your view, do we bring the weight of what business is, the kind of narrative of what business is? So if we read the Financial Times, it's not full of stories about how these businesses are regenerative and working for society and the planet. It's full of how much profit they're making. How do we bring the narrative of business around to exactly what you're saying? Well, that's a great question and a huge one. And I think it starts with mindset and it starts with at a quite an individual level. I think understanding, um, not expecting other businesses, other organizations, other institutions, other people to be the change you want to see in the world. But to start with yourself, mm. I think there's um, there's an opportunity to shift from this model of a world and business of extraction, like you said, what can you take from the planet and what can you take from people to one of creation? Mm. And if we can create business models around creation and that involves, like you said, um, imagination, involves creativity, um, it involves adaptability, mm. then that will shift us from a world of scarcity and something's going to run out to, to a world of plentitude um, and, and abundance. And I think right now we're still stuck in a really archaic business model. I think we are focused on competition rather than collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think there's new economic models that are already um, starting to prove true. You know, if you look at transition towns, if you look at donut economics, um, there are some models already that have that have been really well thought through and that have that are being experimented with with great success. And yeah. we're going to have to break some things. Move fast and break things. Is that not one of the big kind of ethos changes of the modern <laughs> yeah. world? I Dominic think that's Cummings. Dominic Cummings. So. Yeah, he's an interesting <laughs> chap. He'd be an interesting person to speak to. But, um, yes. but I think, you know, we are in, in in relatively, well, actually quite unstable times. Probably more unstable than our species has ever known. And I think I'd agree. And I think if we look back, we'll discover that when this has happened in the past, but not to this level, whether it's an organization, whether it's a, a whole civilization, they tend to try and double down on what they've already known. Yes. Yes. And if you, Rome, for example, <laughs> this is exactly what happened. They were, you know, absolutely yes. at the precipice of the, you know, um, of civilization and, suddenly very unstable times um, happened upon them. And I think they saw themselves as reaching the limit. And mm. yeah. what happens then? Well, the civilization all the way down to the individual seeks comfort and stability and certainty rather than having the ability to embrace uncertainty and to um, intentionally look for discomfort because it's in discomfort where we find growth and where we find imagination and where we find creativity. But when we're needing really strong decision makers, really um, progressive decision making, we need to be able to adapt. But right now we're, we seem to be increasingly inflexible and resistant to change. Mm. At a political level. But while I'm listening to a QAI podcast, I'm hearing business leaders who are right up there, speaking from the same sheet as this, who understand resilience and adaptability. And, and clearly that's because that's what you're about and therefore you're picking these people. But it's so heartening mm. to hear people for whom profit is still a motive because they have to survive and they have shareholders. But where the value of the people who work for them counts and the value they can bring to the world also counts. Mm. And my feeling, having listened to that, is that politicians 
at this moment, given our, the ways that we elect them, are by definition the people who follow. Yes. They are always going to be sheep, but they will follow where the money goes. Because they're also very venal sheep. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm being horribly judgmental, but still. But they do. And therefore, if big businesses can lead the way, then the rest will follow. Am I right? Or am I being overly optimistic? I, th I think you're right. I think there's a real opportunity for that to play out. I think some of the decisions about the who the who are making the decisions is really important and whether that we can create more more flat business models and uh, operational models so things like can, can you tell us what a flat business model is yes yeah, so there's there's different examples sociocracy um holocracy so where you um, flatten the pyramid and you will have um, perhaps small pockets or nodes of teams and groups within organizations that can make uh, have the power to make decisions that in most organizations is down to the, the C-suite or just to the CEO. Yeah. And it's been proven, you know, there's a, a, a few examples of organizations. Um, Precision Nutrition is one that runs on holacracy, have seen phenomenal growth, are able to reach far more people to embrace individualized nutrition and have done that with a completely flat uh, holocratic uh, operation system mm. and what does that do for the individuals the trust that's put in them the empowerment it, it creates conversation connectedness whereas you know just like the education system the business models that we've got to run businesses right now are all about um really the industrialized world yeah and the hierarchical model that we inherited from the romans absolutely we're still trying to double down on stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and hasn't worked for 2,000 years. Exactly what you said, the Roman Empire collapsed because it didn't work, but we have spent the last 2,000 years trying to replicate it and make it work. And at some point, you think someone somewhere would wake up and go, you know, doing the same thing time after time and expecting a different result is the definition Absolutely. of insanity. But you guys have. So I would like, before we go all the way down that line, to take a step back and look at you and Ross getting together and forming AQAI and what it is and what it does, because I think it is an example of everything that you're saying, as I understand it. Yes. Uh, so we originally set up, set up a consultancy called Leaps, and it was designed to run these very fast, intense um, design sprints. Uh, some people might recognize the term design sprints. But most people probably won't. So can you unpick that a little? Sure. So um, it would take somewhere between three and five days to shock a group of people, usually leaders inside an organization, into a different mindset, a different way of thinking with intentional, um, very tactical sort of workshop style initiatives that will get them thinking a different way about challenges that either that business is facing or that the planet is facing. And we would use the lens of the sustainable development goals for this so that we're starting, albeit subtly, to shift some of the leaders in these organizations thinking towards how do we give more to the planet rather than extract more. Hmm. Did they know what they were signing up for when you when you brought these in? Did they know that that was part of the Sometimes, agenda? Sometimes, but often not. It was very intentional yeah. okay. from us. Magic. And, Magic. you know, we were working with large organizations from Unilever to, um, to Reuters. And we would see change very, very quickly and different ways of thinking about problems and very, very different solutions that often embraced new technology often embraced um, doing good for for the planet and for society. When we went to revisit these groups some weeks later, we found that more often than not, they would have gone back to their old habits. And that's not, you know, it's very hard to hold on to a new habit and um, a new mindset. It takes discomfort. And what if, you know, we know human beings don't like discomfort. So 
You also need an environment where everyone is supporting you, you in your new habit. And and we know from everything about relationship and small groups, large groups, is everybody likes you to behave like you used to behave because absolutely, then you are predictable. Absolutely. It's that safety of certainty again. Predictable equals certain and uncertain equals discomfort. So we started to realize that there was something that was causing this immune system response, this immune system response to say, go back hmm. to how you used to do things. And um, we heard this term AQ, this idea of your adapt- the adaptability quotient and started to, through lots and lots of conversations, some deep research to recognize that perhaps this was one of the keys um, to sustainable change, to heading towards intentional change and embra- embracing that idea and also the ability to, to take on uncertainty and to take on discomfort because you have the confidence in your ability to adapt. So we started to um, you know, work with some research partners and started to see, actually, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that we're on the right path here to, to something important. But if we were going to address adaptability and the human condition of adaptability, as well as hopefully following that, the organizational and institutional um, diagnosis of adaptability, then, you know, to to improve something, we needed to measure it. And we did some searching and couldn't find a model of, of AQ. So it became clear that that was our, that was our mission if we decided to. To create the model. To create the model, yeah. yeah. Um, very, dis, you know, discomfort for us because we hadn't, hadn't done anything like this before. Um, and we were entering a world of uncertainty through, well, first of all, how do we, how do we fund a business? What are the different ways to do that? Mm. Um, how do we create collaboration and, and support? How do we build the foundations of, of something, you know, from non-academics? And we're certainly non-academics ourselves. How do we forge partnerships with academia and science to um and forge that with our understanding of business and our contacts in business to uh, create a model that can start to recognize adaptability in a person, in a team, and in an organizational unit. Mm. Because then we might be able to, and our hypothesis was that we'd be able to improve it, that it wasn't static, that it wasn't just something that you are. Because we have these psychometric um, tests and assessments thousands of them that tell you you are this person and you will not change and, and that's one way to guarantee that change is never going to happen absolutely Give someone a box absolutely that they're in. yeah very dangerous really really dangerous uh, thing to do and from a medical field through business through everything if you stick someone if you give them a label they will conform to the label yep yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah so you know that was a uh you know 18 month mission um we found some funding found some wonderful people to support our mission and our dream. And that enabled us to partner with some um, academics, professors, universities, uh, and some businesses to create the model, test the model, and um, give us the confidence to um, take it to the world. Mm. And, you know, we, we did that in quite a unique way. We brought our own ideas of innovation i suppose to this and um, what we had been doing for some years prior to this was intentionally investing our time and some of our own resources as much as we could in understanding what's coming so we would not only be able to go to these design sprints that we were running before with the knowledge of what technologies is coming that we could leverage and also that you need to be aware of because it's going to disrupt your organization and your market, even if you don't believe it will. You know, if you were Nokia and you believed that the iPhone was just a joke, you know, this, yep, I've had. which is no exactly what Nokia did. They yep. did think it was a joke and thought this is going to go yep. away very, very quickly. And yep. they went from, you know, a almost 50, yep. Yep, Leading 50% market to share to 5% very, very quickly, which um, maybe is a good thing because there's um, there's more of the market to share. But we were able to look at what technology is coming and what can we leverage 
within AQAI and the clue is in the name. <laughs> so we started to think about how can we not only deliver a, um, an assessment of somebody's and a measurement of somebody's AQ in a unique but more but a deeper way and a more truthful way, but then how can we leverage technology to quickly and at scale improve adaptability because we did, we haven't got the luxury of time there's been huge transitions in the past you know whether it's the industrial revolution technological revolution where that's happened over quite some time but in this information age but now we're at the... it's happening yeah. so so quickly we are going to see potentially a couple of hundred years of of progress and technological progress in about 10 years. And it will continue to accelerate, you know, provided we don't burn the planet up. It's, it's, that's it's not, not going to no, stop, is it's it? It's not. I mean, like you said, um, unless somebody unleashes something, whether it's nuclear or whether it's, you know, molecular-based and, uh, and uh, pandemic-based. Or we just hit the tipping points that Jim Bendel talks about where, anyway, let's, we don't need to go in there, but, but provided there are still humans, we're in the singularity. And and we're, the rate of change is accelerating faster than it has ever done. And it was quite quite a beautiful sort of segue. There is is it was attending um, Singularity University that actually triggered this idea of AQ. And it was a there was a talk there. Some and it was already in conversation. And um, you know that is a place if anyone doesn't know where it's 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 based close to Silicon Valley. So it's in in a place where technology seems to happen and thrive. And it's a place where businesses, leaders, um, and well, anyone really can go to understand the emergence of exponential technology and its potential uh, future uses and um, perhaps future challenges that they'll um, bring forward to us. So it's a it's a very interesting place. And you came out of it with the AI part of AQAI as as your business. And where does that AI part, where is it going, Mike? And how can we, how can we shape it for a regenerative future? That's a, that's a great question. I think AI is such a huge, huge um, box to open. And it can go in lots of directions from the idea that um, actually AI will be the world's biggest, newest and fastest growing religion. You know that um, mm. AIs will sit on boards, uh, will will sit on um, leadership councils of of institutions and countries, um, and perhaps that's a good thing. But you've got some very intelligent people, whether it was Stephen Hawkins and you know, or um, Sam Harris, or Sam Harris, his TED talk on AI yeah, made a great impact on me, and it's quite hard to see a way around his contention that in military terms the advantage that military ai would give to the side that develops it first pretty much guarantees that the other side would have to wipe them out before they got there which was a very it is a scary thought and it's something we should really be aware of um but there's also i think an opportunity as we could help you know, every citizen make decisions using AI, whether it's at a at the level of an AI telling you and be, uh, you know, in real time that, you know, making you aware of your unconscious bias, whether it's making you aware of, of mm. your cognitive dissonance, allowing you to make decisions by playing out scenarios very quickly. So in a, in a democratic system, showing you if this bill or this law happens, this is exactly how it will impact you Right. your world and the world of other people. And I think um, in a very transparent sort of open world, um, I think we'd be able to apply those AI learnings to our own communities, to our own families and to our business decisions. So there is, a, there is an opportunity, I think, for, for democracy uh, to be elevated with AI. Mm. But this is this requires such a new way of thinking about our governance of AI, and that's what's not happening. You know, the biggest yeah. the biggest community um, population on this planet is Facebook, wow. and we think that we can govern Facebook, 
we tried. The UK tried and said, we summon you to court and we're going to ask you questions mm. and make you feel uncomfortable. But nothing happens. You know, a, a small slap on no. the wrist, which is um, <laughs> it's just completely insignificant for that company. And they turn up in front of the Senate and, and laugh at them fundamentally. A- absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is the problem that, we, that, that we're facing. And unless something is done at, at, at a, a very high level um, of understanding you know, that we need, the, the funny thing is <laughs> we might need an AI to actually govern the algorithm. So a third party algorithm right. at a, go, you know, right. at a world government or um, collaborate collaborative level that can govern the algorithms of these organizations. But they'd have to agree to that happening or it would have to be imposed on them, which would be an interesting. Yeah. I, I think there's, move. and then how would you guarantee that the AI let's say was a progressive AI, because I imagine that there are people who would not want the AI to be what we would define as regenerative and having the flourishing of society and the planet as its baseline motivations. There will be other people who would like to construct a world governance AI with with other baseline motivations. I yeah, it's, it's, I can feel a novel coming on, but in very, real life... It's very hard. I think... Maybe it goes back to when the individuals have access um, and control over their own data. So when we we control the data and have access to um, every single bill or law in the land that exists and um, the the opportunity to see how that impacts their own lives, we don't need an industrial sort of political architecture that we have today to govern those things because we'll yeah. if it, in a democratic system we'll be able to make those informed choices ourselves i mean it's it's um it would also change the nature of the legacy media because at the moment our choices are very often a reflection of what we're told in the newspapers and on mm-hmm. the primary mm-hmm. here terrestrial channels if we had access to our own actual fact-based information, then we would be able to reassess and they would become redundant overnight. Absolutely. Or have to become a lot more flexible in your, you know, their their AQ would have to rise exponentially. They would. We'd have to see quite a big jump, not only in AQ, but in, you know, emotional intelligence um, and in our imagination. So how are we measuring and improving um, and re-releasing our imaginations? Because, you know, democracy might be able to serve that role in choosing the outcomes that we want and the principles that we want to be upheld. And then we just leave the AI (laughs) to work out how best to achieve them. To make it. Then we would also need a very, or we could have a very different baseline for the whole of society. So I'm thinking on my feet here, and this may not work, but I'm remembering the conversation that we broadcast a couple of weeks ago with Eva and Justin, and they had spent lockdown interviewing a 100 people from as broad a range of opinions as they could in Scotland, with a view to that feeding into a people's assembly, with a view to the people's assembly feeding into a citizen's assembly, with a view to the Citizens' Assembly feeding into a constitutional convention, with a view to that completely restructuring the governance of Scotland ahead of independence. Wow. And I'm thinking that that gives a very broad, and I need obviously to hook you up with Eva and Justin, a very broad democratic basis to something that AI could then run the models very quickly of the various things at each of those levels, at the people's, the citizens, and the constitutional convention, Mm. models could be run, which would put into the conversation Mm. a whole new layer of imagination. uh, And then we're moving to, so what is humanity for? Because at the moment, we're for earning enough money to pay the mortgage, a lot of people, or to pay the rent if you're not well enough off or weren't in the right generation to own property. But if we can shift that to life is about flourishing, 
what does flourishing mean, then mm. the profit motive might change. Because I heard you back at the beginning, you said economics and business are different, and they definitely are. But while we're in the competitive model where he or she who earns the most mm. stuff manages to accrue to themselves the most value, is at the top of a hierarchical tree and therefore has power over the people below, then economics and extractive, competitive, profit-based business are yes. intimately linked. But if we can create a governance system and a life system that is predicated otherwise, then the need for that intimate linkage breaks apart and businesses can be for entirely other things. The whole degrowth, Jason Tickle's degrowth concept of, yes, if you want to make a profit, that's great, but your entire profit goes into local charities that you can define. Yes. And and you're there to create well-being and flourishing within your own community. Mm. That's the point of your business. Then you stop trying to sell widgets to people who didn't want widgets in the first place, which is where you started. And you start creating things that enhance the lives of people and are built on regenerative yes, models. Yes. Is that is that where we I we're think heading? we can. The the idea of profit first has been so ingrained um, you know, even even in the teachings of um of current teachings, you know, at an educational level of business and economics, that, that needs needs to change from profit first probably to to purpose first yeah. and it's defining that purpose which should be about imagination and should be exciting and um i think starts you know starts at a young age we need trusted consultants actually who are going into organizations now and who are mm. who are absolutely purpose first and who have access to not only um in these hierarchical hierarchical organizations the um, the C-suite, but also to who they report to, which is, you know, the shareholders. Yeah. Or often it's the market, because I don't think it is the shareholders. It's this it's this imaginary thing called the market that's going to destroy them or build them up mm. and is often built on algorithms. Sorry. No, it's true. Yeah. And, it, again, and the market goes back to people seeking comfort and putting comfort before discomfort and deciding... I think it's really interesting how we'll invest so much as individuals in our own comfort and in our pleasures, whereas the investment that goes into our discomfort and um, refraining ourselves, because mm. perhaps this goes into the idea of, of what freedom is. You know, for me, freedom isn't about choice and variety. And I, I think I learned this in my own journey of, oh, I could go anywhere. I could... Um, I could live on any in any country, mm. you know. And I, I went on this journey with a company called Remote Year. Yes, I did want to ask about that. It sounded amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was it was amazing in lots of ways. There was also there's also I don't think the the business model is the best for the environment. But you, you better tell the listeners what it was because I heard about it on a QAI podcast. But give us a quick review. Very simply. You um, have, if you have the opportunity, which a lot of us do now because of COVID, to work remotely, then this company said we will take fifty or sixty complete strangers, and we'll put them in a group, and we will curate a a year's worth of of travel for you. So we will take you to a different country in a different city every month for twelve months, and we'll we'll set you up in an apartment with a co working office, often co living. Um, with a team in that city who can try and as much as possible in a space of 30 days um, embed you into the local ecosystem, society, live the way locals do. And just when you're getting used to it, we're going to move you somewhere else. Just just when you find it. And that's what I found. It was, it was um, an incredible journey of um, adaptability, of adjusting to um, completely different languages, um, you know, systems, localities, people, cultures, which is a wonderful experience. 
water and air and food. Yeah, you know, just from a naturopathic point of view, your entire gut biome must have been it absolutely completely was, turned yeah. over. It was. It Once was every thirty and, days. Um, difficult to rebalance, but I was glad I had that training. Mm. But what it did was, I, I think it it helped my own AQ um, that we could have done with longer in each in each city. But I think that the the whole journey was was a really interesting one. Um, not only for what does work look like in the future and what is what is work and travel but for me you know I didn't know I, I had this complete freedom of where I could live and actually it was a fake freedom it was completely fake and until I made a commitment to actually scale that down and a commitment to a place to say this is home suddenly that was freedom right it's a, if, if if you want to you know a lot of people think they um you know they don't want to commit to a partner to a relationship because there's so much choice there's so many people there's eight billion people but actually hmm. that's again a fake freedom um we think it's um you know it's that's going to help us seek pleasure and lots of comfort and experiences in our lives but committing to somebody and is is the ultimate freedom of of relationship and yeah. um the reason i i say this is because i think freedom of commitment needs to be prioritized over a a sort of fake freedom of variety you know and right yeah when we think about that in our business models and when we think about you know just like in the 60s where we had a this it was actually freud's um sigmund freud's nephew who completely changed marketing in the world yeah yeah who brought all of his his uncle's concepts yeah into yeah yeah and now we can make exactly. you want a green exactly. toothbrush so we need you know some <laughs> some really some very good intention genius um marketing shifts um to market the discomforts to us to be able you know because i do hope that we we can create a world where the ability to reason is held in really high regard. But this is reasoning on an emotional as well as an intellectual level, heart, heart mind reasoning as well as head mind reasoning. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, and it's the it's the convergence of our feeling mind and our uh, of our feeling mind and our thinking mind together that's accepted. And if that's reflected in our hearts, if that's reflected then in society, and if that's reflected in business, that is massive yes you know because then we'll i think we'll demand something better of ourselves before demanding something better of someone else or another organization or a government right it's 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 kind of what we weave into um our own operating system in in aqai to say you know we must demand something better of ourselves we have to make really good decisions um about the work that we're doing and it's really challenging because for example to do the things we want to do to impact society at a profound level we we need to be creating resources in the organization to invest in that research and doing that so that requires us to us to make a profit or in another system to actually you know to to find constant investment flow in what do investors want well, a lot of investors, a lot of investors will say, Profit. will say something like, you know, they they are they are mission led. You know, they are about societal change. They've created their wealth and uh, then want to put it to good use. But it's hardwired for a lot lot of investors um, that actually, like you said, it's profit first. But you know, we're trying to be very intentional about the investors that we partner with. But it's, yeah, this cycle of, you know, going back to the original point about um, profit and is profit a dirty word? Can it be a clean, positive word? Can it, if it's used, like you said, you know, within a community, when it's used as fuel for good, it can be really good. And if money is considered as a lubricant and what it's lubricating is social interaction and social Mm. exploration. At this moment, we are inventing money out of nothing. I think this is one of the things that Schumacher taught me is it's not, there is no longer any link between dollars or Bitcoin or anything else and actual material anything. 
the money flowing through the stock market every day is more than ridiculous numbers more than the GDP of the entire planet. It's an imaginary number. And if it's an imaginary number, then we can do with it what our imaginations choose we do with it. And how it flows is up to us to decide. And we're all locked in as if money is a physical object with laws like gravity. And it isn't. It's an idea. And we need, I think, the biggest thing that we could do, our generation, is change the idea mm. of what money is for and how it arises. And we need not to have the people whose, whose entire lives are built up with a very structured money is in short supply and we are doling it out to those who, who are worthy, which is what our politicians are doing. Yeah, they're making it absolutely. out of nothing. And I think you know maybe, and this is perhaps a little bit of a tangent, but on you know this idea of tokenizing, tokenizing value and exchanging it. So things like blockchain and, and cryptocurrency are actually really interesting mm. concepts that I that I believe will become hugely mainstream. You know that having the potential to take away uh, a, a intermediary, you know the banks, etc., um, yes. in in what we have right now, which is an industrialized organizing system. Yes, I, I did a term paper about blockchain at Schumacher. And I think, first of all, there's huge, huge potential. And second, the great big banks, mm. Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, would not have entire absolutely sub companies devoted to developing their own blockchain if it were not really, really important. I'm aware we're heading towards the end of our time. And I think Blockchain is so exciting, but we'd need to expand for people for whom it's not even an idea. But as we run to the end, would you like to tell us a little bit about your AI concept, the ADA concept, and how that might have a role in bridging governance, business, and and humanity? Sure. Yeah, so in, going back to an earlier comment I think I made around doing this at speed and scale brought us to a certain type of AI, which is uh, in particular digital twinning. So for anyone not sort of uh, au fait with that term, then um, I'll give you a real example. So Deepak Chopra, who a lot of us will know is a, a coach and mentor and seen as quite a leader in the, in the field of meditation and mindfulness. To work with Deepak, it's quite expensive if you wanted him to be your uh, coach um, to improve something, so to, to shift your mindset, to um, be able to learn how to meditate, to unlock you know, uh, and evolve consciousness. Um, but if you wanted to do that with a, a huge number of people, so rather than Deepak Chopra working with, let's say, 100 individuals and seeing them once or twice a year, he what if he could work with... 10 million and see them every day what change would that have on the mindset and acceleration of that learning and that process so he has partnered with um, the uh, ai foundation to create a digital twin so they take every single bit of writing uh, response video that's being recorded book that's being written uh, by deepak and all these interactions and the ai will analyze all of these and create a multitude of algorithms. Um, there'll then be a process of perhaps recreating a visual representation um, is as close to reality as possible. And we have some wonderful companies and technologies to be able to do that really effectively so that it's hard to actually know if you're talking to a real person or a digital version. Have, have they genuinely cracked the Turing test now, do you think? I don't think yet, but I don't think it's far off. Okay. And and for people who are not familiar, this was the famous Turing, Alan Turing, who set a concept way back in the Second World War, I think, that at some point it would be possible for a human being to interact with someone on the other side of a screen and not know if they were interacting with a human being or a computer. We, we are close. So Deepak has this now. Um, so there's a digital twin of, of himself and those 10 million people can can have conversations with the digital Deepak <laughs> and at a fraction of the cost 
that they were the real defect. Rather than charging those, you know, 100 people. And, and still be making orders of magnitude more money than he was before. <laughs> if, if that was a desire, yes. but also could completely demonetize it, could completely demonetize it, because it only not only democratizes it, but it demonetizes it. And um, they'll, they'll get about 80 to 90% of the same responses, advice, intuition etc that they would have got from the real human and they can do it in real time absolute real time so what we'd like to do is in our model of adaptability there are 15 core dimensions of adaptability from resilience to hope you know to grit to your mindset your motivation i won't go into all those details but we are forming partnerships with experts in those dimensions um so take Unlearning is one of them, our ability to to forget, to intentionally let go of a certain way of thinking about something or doing something. And Barry O'Reilly wrote the book, for example, uh, on unlearning. And if we can replicate the um, these individuals and their experience, their knowledge and their application of their speciality into a combined um, AI being, who we call Ada at the moment, and give Ada her own personality um, that is flexible in itself and adaptable in itself and uh, understand the learning style. So, Manda, I, we could understand your learning style um, and there are technologies to do that by wow. um, assessing that with you. So you might be very auditory, you know, for example, and, and that would become quite apparent through some simple tests and uh, and looking deeper into you as an individual so we can really personalize that coaching journey we can personalize the the learning pathway that we design and that you go on as an individual to improve your aq through ada and we can make that accessible to if we want hopefully one you know, hundreds of millions the of people. entire planet basically anyone with a signal and a phone. Yes, anywhere in the world. And you can pick this model up and you can you, you don't just have to apply it to adaptability. You could take creativity as a theme and a, and a skill and use the same technology and layering for, for creativity and start to reimagine lifelong learning and education with, with through this lens, which isn't designed to replace human to human and group activities and I think they are so so important we know they are so so important but there's also this to work in tandem which could accelerate a lot of the learnings and the mindsets because that's what we need to do it's the mindsets you know we must build adaptability into the infrastructure of our mindsets if we can if we can do that um, then that's a really different way of looking at looking at the world and we know we've got to build in adaptability to every facet of society for us to be able to go and go and seek the change that we want or to just to adapt to stuff like this year, like yeah. like COVID, yeah. to be able to adapt and um, find the best way through, to be able to survive through hardship and discomfort, to be able to thrive on the other side. That is so beautiful. We're going to have to draw to a close as we're closing when do you think Ada will be something that people can connect with? When will she be out in the world? Realistically, um, I think it's going to be about two years. Okay. I think there's um, we're we're still seeking investment and partners and collaborations to to make that happen, which is the way it will happen through radical collaboration. So so okay. Anybody out there who knows the people with the money, you know where it needs to go. <laughs> so, Mike, thank you so much. This has been revelatory. I can feel several other podcasts. I, I remember in the years when I was thinking of doing a PhD, everybody said that each PhD should spawn at least half a dozen more or it wasn't worth doing. And I think yes, good podcasts yes. each spawn half a dozen more. And I can, I can think of several that I would like to do at some point. But in the meantime, I hope this has inspired everybody listening as much as it has inspired me. It feels... I feel hopeful for the first time in quite a while. So thank you very much. No, thank you. It's um, been a, a wonderful journey and conversation. And if I can just say this feeling of being hopeful, as much as it's really beautiful, I think there's um, there's a real danger behind hope. And it's a really interesting area in, in, in adaptability. But 
you know, don't hope for better, just just be better. You know, don't um, hope for more compassion, just be more compassionate, be be more resilient. Sometimes just the awareness of these things um, can be enough of a start, enough of a, of a catalyst. And Okay, I'm hearing that. Yes, there's a beautiful quote and there's a very lovely book called The Best of Times, The Worst of Times by Paul Behrens, who I will talk to in a month or so. And he quotes somebody whose name I can't remember saying, optimism is a bloke leaning back on his chair with his feet on the desk. Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And I I rather like that too. It's an active process and it's not a passive concept that everything is going to be fine at all. But it's a, we can get out there and we can make the world a better place. I love that. So thank you. Thank you. So that's it for another week. Huge thanks to Mike for offering hope in all its forms as a verb with its sleeves rolled up, for showing us what adaptability is and how we can begin to incorporate that in our own lives, in finding those places of discomfort and really leaning into them to see what our imaginations fire when we can no longer depend on tomorrow being a reiteration of yesterday. Please go out and try that. Find ways of making difference. Find ways of expanding. Find ways of your world beginning to change. Because the world is beginning to change. And we so badly need not to revert to the things that were broken before we ever started. So there we go. We'll be back next week with another conversation. And in the meantime, thanks, as always, to Caro C for being the world's best sound engineer and for the music at the head and foot of the podcast. Thanks to Faith Tillery for being an inspiration, for designing the website and for being the other half of the creative team that is Accidental Gods. If you want to come and visit the website, we're at accidentalgods.life and you'll find the other podcasts there, the visualisations and meditations in the resources section and access to the Accidental Gods membership programme, which is a structured training designed to give everyone the tools we need to reach conscious evolution, which is the next step. This is where we're going. This is where we have to go if we're going to ride the tsunami of change that is coming. So if you know of anybody else who wants to be part of riding that wave, then do send them this link. And meanwhile, that's it for now. See you next week. Thank you and goodbye.